there's a craving in our world for realness. The buzzword authentic is a buzzword for a reason. We want the people we do life with to be authentic. We want the brands and movements that we support to be authentic. We expect those who lead us to be authentic. We want the things that matter to us to be real, to be true. We want the experiences and encounters we have to be what they're supposed to be. But what about our faith? Follower will equip you to teach students what an authentic relationship with Christ looks like and to empower them to live out this faith in their daily lives. The call for students to live out a faith that's true and real in today's world starts with the call to be a follower, a Christ follower. Teach follower and challenge your students to embrace an authentic faith. There's a craving in our world for realness. The buzzword authentic is a buzzword for a reason. We want the people we do life with to be authentic. We want the brands and movements that we support to be authentic. We expect those who lead us to be authentic. We want the things that matter to us to be real, to be true. We want the experiences and encounters we have to be what they're supposed to be. But what about our faith? Follower will equip you to teach students what an authentic relationship with Christ looks like and to empower them to live out this faith in their daily lives. The call for students to live out a faith that's true and real in today's world starts with the call to be a follower, a Christ follower. Teach follower and challenge your students to embrace an authentic faith.
there's a craving in our world for realness. The buzzword authentic is a buzzword for a reason. We want the people we do life with to be authentic. We want the brands and movements that we support to be authentic. We expect those who lead us to be authentic. We want the things that matter to us to be real, to be true. We want the experiences and encounters we have to be what they're supposed to be. But what about our faith? Follower will equip you to teach students what an authentic relationship with Christ looks like and to empower them to live out this faith in their daily lives. The call for students to live out a faith that's true and real in today's world starts with the call to be a follower, a Christ follower. Teach follower and challenge your students to embrace an authentic faith. There's a craving in our world for realness. The buzzword authentic is a buzzword for a reason. We want the people we do life with to be authentic. We want the brands and movements that we support to be authentic. We expect those who lead us to be authentic. We want the things that matter to us to be real, to be true. We want the experiences and encounters we have to be what they're supposed to be. But what about our faith? Follower will equip you to teach students what an authentic relationship with Christ looks like and to empower them to live out this faith in their daily lives. The call for students to live out a faith that's true and real in today's world starts with the call to be a follower, a Christ follower. Teach follower and challenge your students to embrace an authentic faith. Why? Why? Why did Jesus come to earth? Why forsake the majesty and fellowship of heaven? Exchanging a palace for a stable. Immortal comforts for a feeding trough. And robes of glory for the feeble body of an infant. An unparalleled irony, this supreme, unrivaled nobility experiencing absolute and total humility. Our sovereign God, Emmanuel, 
as a baby. He didn't come to heap shame upon sinners, or to judge and cast out the impious, but to break bread with those called unrighteous. He didn't come to illuminate every mystery of the cosmos, or to enlighten the intellectual, but to fulfill the testimony of prophets clothed in rags. He didn't come to elevate a single nation, or to advocate a particular political affiliation. He came because he saw you, broken, in need of salvation. He saw you lost and abandoned, crying out, surrounded by deaf ears, fighting through the tears, but beaten down by the torments of this world. And unable to bear your distress, he renounced his eternal throne, walked the earth, bore the stripes, accepted the nails, and gave up his last breath, so that you could receive the breath of life. Our God, our holy, infinite God, beheld your pain, perceived your heart, and determined that your soul was worth dying for. From the manger, to the cross, to the empty tomb, it is all a story of profound love of a savior who rescued his children from darkness. Of a blameless king who declared that no sacrifice was too great for the sake of his beloved creation. Why did Jesus come to earth? He came for you. Good morning, and welcome to Crossroads Baptist Church today. What a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord, amen? I'm so glad that you've been chosen to be here with us today. Today we're going to present to you, uh, and unto the Lord, a cantata entitled, Sing Joy to All the World, and I hope that this is a blessing to you as we celebrate Christmas together. What a beautiful time that the Lord had planned all along from the beginning of creation the Father knew that he would have to send his Son. And at this time that we celebrate the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, I just pray that we would all reflect on our need of him. And that this morning we would acknowledge that need of a Savior. And that we'd celebrate his coming this morning together. God bless you as you share with us this morning this beautiful music that we've prepared for you. And for the Lord. I pray that this worship is a blessing. Amen. <clears throat> we gather to tell the story of Emmanuel. God with us. We gather to remember this story, to wait and watch for him to come again. Even now, come Lord Jesus.
in the beginning, God created. God created human beings to love and be loved. God chose his greatest creation for this, but they did not choose God. Again and again, they turned away, but God didn't give up. He kept calling. He kept loving. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Though they walked in darkness, the people of God remembered his light. They tried everything to get back to God themselves, but they couldn't. They cried out in their distress. God heard them. He had a plan. Because they could not get to him, he would go to them himself. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. people of God had walked in darkness so long that they did not remember how to live in His light. So God made a plan to prepare their hearts for Him again. He sent an angel to a priest named Zechariah with a message. The angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to call him John. 
He will bring many of the people of Israel back to the Lord, their God. He will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Through John, God prepared the world for himself. John told the people to turn away from their darkness. He told them what God was like so they could recognize him when he came. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. but not in the way most people had expected. He did not come as a mighty king or as a mysterious force. He came as a baby, both born to a woman named Mary. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. Her name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings! You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. God was teaching his people about himself. He doesn't come with force, but with humility and tenderness. He doesn't come through human action or will, but by his own perfect plan and loving power. Through Mary, God taught his people how to receive him through graceful surrender. I am the Lord's servant, Mary responded. May your word be in me to be fulfilled.
God had done it. Jesus, Emmanuel, had come for his people once and for all. Through the, though the world did not know that anything had changed, everything had. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger. Though the world did not know it yet, good news was coming. Heaven could not contain its joy. The angels were amazed at the beauty of God's plan and the depth of his love. An angel announced the good news to some shepherds. And immediately, all of heaven was lit up with rejoicing over what God had done. Well, suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heavens, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. had come for his people. He showed them how to live with his life. 
He showed them how to die with his death. And he offered them a new life, a new way, as he rose from his own grave. He did this not just for one moment in history, but for all moments yet to come. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever.
being here today. The choir will have a bit more to sing in a moment, but I want to share a few words with you before we proceed. You know, the first book in the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, where the birth of Jesus is first recorded, this first book in the, in the New Testament begins in a way that uh, seems strange to our modern American literary sensibilities. The story of the hero of the whole book, Jesus Christ, doesn't begin with some great event from his life to try to pick our interest and get us into the reading. No, it begins with a genealogy, a long genealogy, like 16 verses of genealogy. Who begins a book like that? It, it starts like this. The genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Well, Matthew kind of tips his hand a bit by mentioning David and Abraham before he mentions any of the other people in Jesus' family line. He wanted to make sure that we understood that Jesus filled, fulfilled all of the expectations that the Jews had concerning the coming Messiah. He was the seed of Abraham, spoken of in Genesis chapter 22, verse 17, who would uh, be the one that would bless all the nations. And he was the root uh, springing up from the stump of David's family line, uh, spoken of by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Now every... Every Jew in the first century would recognize the names David and Abraham and they would consider them to be some of the finest ornaments that anyone could have in their family tree. But Matthew goes on to list some other more tarnished ornaments in the uh, lineage of Jesus as well. Verse 3, there's a woman named Tamar. Tamar kind of finagled her way into the royal lineage by dressing up as a harlot and seducing Judah, one of Jacob's boys. And then in verse 5 of Matthew chapter 1, we're introduced to two other women, uh, Rahab and Ruth. Now, Rahab was not an Israelite at all. She was a Canaanite, in fact, and a former prostitute from the city of Jericho. And Ruth, Ruth was a Moabitess. The Moabites were relatives of the Jews through Lot, Abraham's nephew. But they didn't believe the same things. They didn't share the same religion. In fact, the Moabites... Uh, had uh, many gods. They were pagans, and some of their gods even required detestable human sacrifice. God was so put off by the Moabites that he commanded that no Jew ever could marry a Moabite unless that Moabite completely renounced their faith and became fully Jewish. And we get to verse 6, and maybe the most well-known name of the, of, of the women in Jesus' family line is there, the name Bathsheba. You remember Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah, whom David stole through a sordid tale of adultery and murder. You know, most people go to some lengths to try to conceal the more disrespectful people in their family tree. And not only that, but back in those days, uh, these genealogies always listed only fathers and sons, not mothers and daughters. But Jesus was different. He uh, was unashamed. In fact, it seems like that he went out of his way through his spirit to inspire Matthew to include, even point out these women uh, of questionable background and questionable character. Why would 
actually do that? Why would God begin his New Testament this way? I think it's obvious. He wanted us to know that Jesus Christ was intended to be joy for all people. You see, Jesus' roots may have been firmly planted in Israel, but his branches spread out over the whole world to people of all kinds and stripes, to every corner of the world. Jesus' bloodline may have been Jewish, but his genealogy shows us that he didn't come to be just the Messiah of the Jews. Not just the Messiah of brown-skinned Middle Eastern people or white-skinned European people or black-skinned African people, but the Messiah of all the people. And uh, even though Jesus was the only person who ever lived that uh, never knew sin, he didn't come to be the Messiah of just Just people who don't struggle with addictions or sexual misconduct or greed or lying or, well, you know the list. You can add whatever you imagine there. No. Jesus came to be the Messiah of all the people. God wanted us to know from the very beginning as he weaved His grace throughout every page of the New Testament, starting with the first page, the first chapter, the first verse, this genealogy. He wanted us to understand that Jesus was the Messiah for all people, that Jesus' message of forgiveness of sin and inclusion into the lineage of heaven and the promise of salvation for all people this was intended to be joy, great joy for all people. And that's why our song today and the song that you sing so often at this time of the year is the same song as the song of the angels, joy to the world. The Lord has come. And the Bible says it this way. It says, uh, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, will be saved. That's a good first word right there. Whoever call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter what kind of characters might be in your family tree. It didn't matter it doesn't matter what nation you're from. It doesn't matter what flag you salute. It doesn't matter what sins you may have committed. Jesus Christ came to be the Messiah. That is, God's anointed one to fix what's broken. To make things right in the world and in your life. He came to be the Messiah of all the people. And he stands ready to be yours. This morning, if that's something that resonates within your heart, something that you would like to talk to someone more about, maybe talk about becoming a follower of Jesus Christ, of this Messiah of God, we want to be available to you. So know that right after the service, you're welcome to come and talk to me or Brother Stewart, my associate pastor, Brother Terry, can give you direction. Others in this place, I'm sure, could. And you're welcome to contact me by my cell phone. My cell phone number is 210-422-7316. And just as soon as the service is over, I wish you'd text me and let me know that you'd like to talk to someone about uh, what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I'll get back with you as soon as I can. 210-422-7316. We'd love to hear from you about uh, your interest in following Jesus.
God bless you. Consider his call in your life. But don't consider too long. Make a decision. Become a follower of Jesus Christ. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts now. Help each one of us to understand where we stand in relationship to Jesus, whether we have accepted him as our Savior or not. We thank you, Father, that he came to be the Savior, the Messiah of all the people, including everyone in this place and everyone who is listening to the sound of my voice. So speak to our hearts, Father. Help us all to choose to follow you. We pray in Jesus' name. God has come for us. We are the people who have walked in darkness, who have chosen our own path. We are the people who have tried to earn our way back to God and failed. We are the people whom God had never forgotten, never stopped loving, never stopped choosing. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. People of God, he came for us. He is coming right this moment. He will come each time we turn to him. He is born into our world every day. And with his arrival, he brings his kingdom right here, right now. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has lifted up the humble.
extend my thank you as well. Thank you for being here this morning. And I want to extend a thank you to all of these musicians that have gathered and who have worked so diligently to put this beautiful music together to share with you and the Lord this morning. Amen. Amen. I pray that this launches you into the joy of the season, that you leave here with that love and joy of the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart this morning, that you might share that with everyone that you encounter. Recently, I thought of this word, enjoy. We all know it. It comes from some old French word, but regardless, we often think of that word as a consumer word. We enjoy something means that we kind of take it in. We consume something. But the reality, the word enjoy means to make joy. To enjoy means to make joy. And how appropriate for us, those created in the image of the creator God, that he would call us to make joy. So as we leave this place this morning, I would encourage you to be joy makers and not just consumers of joy. That you might spread the light of Christ wherever you go because that light shines from within you. I pray God's blessing on you this morning as we play our closing piece this morning. Come, Lord Jesus. Though our world is dark, your light overcomes the darkness. Though we have wandered, your love is steadfast. Though we lose our way, you have made a way. Though our fear is great, your joy is greater. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, Christ the Lord. <laughs>
Sorry for interrupting your party here for a moment, but I, I need to say something. I appreciate Brother Terry so much, and he worked so hard to pull together this group and to make all this work, and I know the team did a great job as well back there. But nothing has been said yet this morning about the fact that uh, this is the last day that we're emphasizing a love offering for Terry's fifth anniversary at our church. And so I wanted to make sure that you didn't forget about that. Um, he, he's an important guy around here. God works through him to help us to worship every single Sunday. And so we appreciate you, Brother Terry. I love you. I'm grateful for you. And we all see it this morning. Now, do you want to say anything else or shall I dismiss them? Okay. Um, just a quick reminder, if you're a guest this morning, we would love to have you register your attendance. You can do that by looking at, there's a QR code like that, it's in the bulletin. I think it's on the back of many of the chairs, if you'll just aim your phone at that. The website will pop up there and you'll be able to register as a guest very easily. We'd love to know about your presence today and uh, what brought you here and how we can minister to you. And so there's some questions on there that you can answer and that'll give us a good uh, chance to know about that. We're so grateful that all of our guests have come since we've been clapping for everybody, let's welcome our guests this morning, all right? And of course, we pray God's blessings on every one of you and wish you a very, very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. You're dismissed.